We're part way through 21 days of prayer and fasting. This week we're going to be looking at um, how we can be a blessing to our local community. We decided the best way to have a preach today was to let Matt and Heidi Chow speak to you. Matt and Heidi, for me, are probably one of the best representations um, that I've ever known in my life of a couple and a family who live what they believe, which is, term, which is being people that are totally sold out to release the love of Jesus into their local community. So I'm simply going to hand over now to Matt and Heidi. Okay. Thanks, Ian. Okay. Um, yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, so today we're going to be carrying on with our conversation about vision as a church. Um, we're in the last stretch of the 21 days of prayer and fast, and I really hope you've had a, ta- a chance to take a step back and to really tune in to what God is speaking into your life and what he's speaking into the life of our church. Um, so in the first week of the 21 days of prayer and fast, we looked at connecting with God. Um, last week, the second week, we looked at connecting with each other. Um, and going into the third week, um, we're going to be focusing on connecting with community. So um, Matt and I are going to have a conversation um, about uh, some of our experiences, some of our stories, and some of the things that we've learned along the way. And I do feel like that Hannah and Sammy have kind of stolen the show completely because they've actually covered a lot of what, we were, what we're going to say. But I just want to say well done, Hannah and Sammy. And we haven't even kind of, it wasn't complete, it wasn't planned at all. Um, so I've been told that um, you can ask us any questions, any live questions, so put them on the chat. But do be gentle with us because we're very delicate. Um, No, not really. We're as tough as old nails. So just be brutal. It's fine. Go ahead. Um, So Matt, um, I thought we could start this conversation off by um, sharing a little bit about ourselves um, and sharing um, a bit about our origin story. You know, what were the things that happened in our life that kind of fueled our passion for mission? So Matt, do you want to go first and say, you know, how did you become so passionate about mission? Uh, Yeah, sure, Heidi. Um, So my origin story, I believe, like, uh, started in 93. Uh, I went to work in uh, Hong Kong and um, between 93 to 95. And so just before going, um, I, uh, well, my church uh, said to me, yeah, we'll, we'll connect you with another church in Hong Kong uh, for whose couple we know. And so the church was St. Stephen's Society and it was ran by a lady called Jackie Pullinger. Um, and I never knew Jackie at the time. Um, so, um, but just for everyone else, uh, just give a summary. So Jackie is, uh, is a British lady uh, who uh, wanted to be a missionary in the 60s. And uh, she ended up being in Hong Kong uh, and just ministering uh, to the poor and the marginalized. Uh, so it were people like uh, struggling with drug addiction, um, gangs, um, sex workers, uh, homeless people. Um, so um, that's what she did. And I just believe that over those two years, um, Jackie really made a big impact on my life. And uh, even on the Sundays that, you know, for two years I was listening to her preaches at m- most Sundays. So it's about 90 to 100 preaches. Um, and, um, so, and just seeing her talk about grace and compassion, but also demonstrating that through the work that she does, just blows you out of the water. Uh, it blows my mind too. So, um, and um, for me, while I was there, I actually um, helped out. Uh, after work, I would go to help out in St. Stephen's Society. Uh, and I attended, uh, or I helped out at this drug addict meeting, which Jackie uh, ran. And uh, so, uh, it's, so basically, uh, it's people who uh, have an addiction, but they're just waiting to come into one of the houses uh, that was organised for people to come off uh, to detox, come off drugs, and also uh, to come to know Jesus throughout the year, uh, that time there. Um, and um, the other thing that I did was I worked with uh, the youth in the church. Uh, so one of my love is that I, I actually love dancing. So I've just like shared my secret with everyone. But um, so uh, one, one thing I did was that I created uh, uh, dance routines uh, for the youth and then I'll teach it with them uh, and then we'll take it out onto the streets uh, of Hong Kong. Uh, we do the dance and then we'll share the gospel through that way. So are we going to get to see any of these dances? Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. If we have time I might do that now. Uh, but no. So um, yeah and um, so for me I think um, 
Uh, so just before leaving Hong Kong, three months before, um, I actually uh, joined uh, Jackie's first uh, missionary training program called the Help Mobile. And uh, 120 people uh, from around the world got together. And uh, what Jackie did was she uh, taught us in the morning uh, for three months um, uh, just what it means to be on mission. Um, and also in the afternoon and uh, evenings, we'll go out and do the work that the church does. Mm. Um, and so just before coming back as well, um, Jackie said to us that we need to look for a lifetime goal, a lifetime calling. And so I, I did. I, I spent uh, three hours. I went to an island in Hong Kong and I spent three hours um, just uh, praying, uh, asking God and listening uh, and uh, even drawing a picture of what I saw in front of me. Uh, and then suddenly I heard, uh, well, I saw uh, this picture um, or vision that uh, I was standing in front of a pulpit and um, I was uh, sharing to pe a, so a group of people came, they sat down and listened to what I was saying. And then I sent them all away out to, through another door. And then they, another group of people came in and that vision repeated itself like three times. And then I heard a voice, uh, I heard God saying, feed my sheep. Um, and um, so uh, with that, I um, ended up um, like, I, I think like, yeah, so, uh, so just before coming back um, as well to the UK, I heard God saying, whatever job you're going to do uh, back in the UK will be your last job, your last secular job. Uh, so from 95 to 2000, I worked uh, five years and then I heard God saying, this is, it, you know, this is the time to go. Um, and so, you know, 20 years down the line, uh, plus, yeah, um, I've actually, you know, here I am. Um, and I think that when I look back at the picture of the pulpit, um, you know, I, 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 I believe that God's, um, even for the first seven years, I've, I kind of thought that God saying that, you know, I initially thought that it was like, um, I'm going to be, uh, you know, maybe a pastor or something like that. And I did, I tried uh, like seven years, I worked in youth and I worked in this, being an associate pastor. But afterwards, I, um, I look back now and, I, and I, God spoke to me really clearly and just said that the pulpit actually could be that God's given me the authority uh, to speak, uh, speak out my passion uh, for the people who are lost and also my uh, love for the people in my community. Um, and that's how I feel, and that's, and that's where I am today. And I just thank uh, Ian and Chris uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, over the, uh, you know, the six years I've been here so far. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, Heidi, I know I shared a lot about uh, uh, Jackie and her impact on me. I also know that Jackie played a big part in your life too. Would you like to share? Yeah, so yeah, my story starts probably a little bit earlier. And when I was a child, um, I used to see images of poverty on television, like on the news or documentaries, and it would really affect me. And, um, and I, wasn't even, I wasn't even a Christian back then. I became a Christian when I was 16. Um, and after I became a Christian, mm -hmm. I read two mm -hmm. books, um, which were to influence the rest of my life. Um, that first book was Jackie Pollinger's uh, Chasing the Dragon. Um, and the second book was Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger by a guy called Ron Sider. Mm. And what um, both these books had in common was that both these books were about God's heart for the poor and the marginalized and the oppressed. Um, and I realized that after reading these two books that the reason why my heart was so stirred up to that point in my life around these issues was because these are the issues that stirs God's heart. You know, God's mm. my maker. So it kind of made so much sense to me and made me actually love and worship God even more. Um, so in, the, in my gap year before university, um, I decided to do a proper fangirl thing. And actually I went to Hong Kong to look for Jackie Pullinger. So I spent my gap year in Hong Kong. Um, I worshipped in her church and I eventually uh, started working in one of her drug rehabilitation homes for women who were coming off heroin. Um, mm. So we would pray for the women to come off heroin, pray for them in tongues, um, and then we would um, share life with them and live with them to mm. help mm. disciple them into a new lifestyle. Yeah. And, and being in her church, you know, was really... Um, it was everything that I had read about in the book and more, you know, and it was such an exciting time because um, they would preach about um, Isaiah 61 because actually it was their church's vision and mandate just as it is Restore's yeah, uh, right, vision yeah. and, you yeah. know, this is, and, and Isaiah 61 is where Restore gets mm. its name from. And um, so, yeah, so, but, but the exciting thing was not that, not that it was just preached and that we sung worship songs about Isaiah 61, but that actually the church was full of people who were um, filled with the Holy Spirit and, and, and being empowered by the Holy 
Holy Spirit to go out and to bring good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted and to declare freedom for the captives. Um, and, and one of the key things I took out from my time um, in Hong Kong was that I realized that, you know, church isn't about just me meeting my nice Christian friends on a Sunday morning, but that church mm. is about mm. mission. Um, mm. And um, there's this really, uh, there's this famous quote that um, it comes from William Temple, um, which is that the church is the only organization in the world that exists for its non-members. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. And so right. since that, since my time, you know, since, since that time in my life, um, in that gap year that I took, um, I've been trying to, you know, build connections with individuals and community, build connections with various groups that I've worked with over the years in community. Um, but also my day job is mm -hmm. I work as a social justice campaigner. And so I run public campaigns to try and change government policies that are, um, that are creating and sustaining poverty and inequality, both here in this country and around the world. Wow. Uh, thanks for sharing, Hayes. Um, and I think that, um, just want to say really that, um, when you said that you work as a social justice campaigner, I always feel that you underplay uh, what you do. Um, I'll just give you an example that uh, one morning I was just coming down to the kitchen having breakfast and uh, you was on the Zoom call uh, with the shadow cabinet. Um, and, um, you know, I was just like, just a bit taken aback and thinking, what is going on here? You know, this is... Uh, I'm in the middle of my kitchen and you're in the, you know, having a meeting with all these politicians. Um, so um, I just think that you are in such a unique position um, and that uh, you are living out Isaiah 61. So I'm really proud of you. Oh. <laughs> no, thanks for that. And, um, you know, I'm really grateful to have the role that I have um, at the moment. And, you know, it was a really long journey, actually, from being 18 and going to Jackie's Church and, and doing what I'm doing now. And but that's a whole other sermon and we can <laughs> we'll have to cover that another time. But, yeah, so, um, yeah, so we've both shared a little bit about our origin story. And I thought we could start um, and now we can ask and I thought we should really move on to the question of why. I mean, Ian always says start with the why. You know, yeah. so often we jump with the how and the what's and mm. actually we want to really explore the question. Um, why do you think that it's so important to connect with community? Um, Matt, why do you think that, you know, we need to be, um, be why do we need to be on mission um, in, in the community? Yeah, uh, so I think the church should do two things. Um, they should live out the uh, great commandment and they should live out the great commission. So the great commandment uh, was when a uh, teacher of the law asked Jesus, uh, teach, you know, what must I do? Uh, so what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied, uh, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul, and the others to love your neighbours as yourself. Um, and to me, the great commandment should be the foundation um, uh, for, for mission. Um, and, um, you know, that's loving your God. So it's not just, to me, it's not just an understanding of the work of the cross, um, but it's the experience of the grace and compassion that God has in our own lives, and we need to be impacted by that. Um, otherwise, I think that we would just go through um, the wrong reasons, like helping others with, mm. for, the, for the wrong reasons, wrong motives, wrong perspectives. Um, and it's just like, um, it reminds me of the uh, story of the unmerciful servant, where the um, servant owed uh, this unpayable debt to his master, and um, However, the master forgave him for his debt. Um, but what the uh, servant did was that his friends owed him money. So he threw them into prison and says, pay back all that you owe me, uh, otherwise you'll never leave the prison. You'll, you'll be in prison for, for life. Yeah. No, and I'm, I'm really glad that you've mentioned the, the great commandment because it's such a foundational verse for all of life, really, um, that we can never repeat it enough. And um, I think you're so right that, you know, love has to be the foundation. Love has to be the motivation. And... Mm. Um, and I think that when we love God first and it enables us to see people through the eyes of God, that we see them not through the labels that maybe society has given them or maybe that labels that they've given themselves, mm -hmm. but that we see them as people who, have, who God has deemed worthy of his love, that people who God has deemed worthy of his sacrifice. Um, and, so when we, when we, and so when we do that, then we're able to act out of love rather than out of you know, obligation or duty or, mm. or, or whatever. And um, you know, before I dated you, Matt, um, I used to um, I used to think to myself that whoever I date, um, who, uh, whoever I marry in the future, they're going to have to if they love me, they're going to have to love my mum, 
um, <laughs> because I was so close to my mum. I just couldn't imagine someone, um, you know, someone going out, going out with someone who didn't love my mum um, the same amount that I loved her. Um, so and so, I've done pretty well then. Yeah, it, yeah, you, you're not, not too bad. You don't love her as much as I do. But anyway, um, but yeah. So, but I feel like I wonder, I wonder whether sometimes for God it's like that. You know that if you love me, you will love my people. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and, and, and it's kind of my turn to um, uh, uh, to gush about you a little bit now um, <laughs> because you know I think for me in the three decades that I've known you, you for me really demonstrate what it looks like to love people into the kingdom of God. Um, when you were working in central London many years ago, there was a homeless guy who was sitting outside your office and you would, um, every day you would have a chat with him, you befriended him, and every week you would go to the staff canteen and you would get him a hot meal and you would sit with him on the pavement of Oxford Street and you would eat your hot meal together. Um, <laughs> there was another guy in our community and he, you know, mm. had a very broken background but, and <clears throat> so um, he never learnt to read, um, mm. but he was really interested in faith and so you spent 30 minutes with him every week reading the Bible to him, reading it over him. Um, and there's so many people's homes in the community that I've watched you sort of go into and help them clean up their homes because they've been struggling for whatever reason and you've literally just cleaned up their homes. You know, you've got your, lifted up your, your sleeves and you've got your hands in, and your hands dirty. Mm. Um, and, you know, I always call you a serial taxi driver because you're forever kind of taking people to doctor's appointments, hospital appointments, airports and whatever. So I just really feel that, you know, some of these people over the years have come to faith and some haven't. But for me, mm. you, for the most the important thing is that you've always acted in love. Um, and it really reminds me of this um, quote from Maya Angelou, which says that people will forget what you said to them. People will forget um, what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Mm. Um, and for me, that re really sort of emphasizes for me how important mm. you know, the great commandment is. Oh, okay. oh, thank you, Heidi. And um, also thank you for the support that you've given me over the three decades uh, while I was serving in, in ministry. Yeah, no, I, I mean, for me, it's, it, I, I feel like we've done it together. I don't feel like it was mm. me supporting you. I feel like you've, you've supported me massive. But before mm. we descend into kind of renewing our vows um, on this online <laughs> stream, um, so yeah, we were talking about uh, the Great Commandment being the reason why um, connecting with community is so important. And you were saying the second one was uh, the Great Commission. Yeah, so the Great Commission uh, was uh, just before Jesus ascended to the right hand of, the fa of his father. Um, he said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, mm. therefore go and make disciples of all nations. And for me that, um, you know, uh, the Great Commission, simply putting it, is that we do it because Jesus told us to. Um, and when you look at, uh, when you hear Jesus saying all authority um, in heaven and on earth um, has been given to me, that has such a weight to it um, that, you know, it's, it's the authority above all authorities, above heaven, mm. above mm. earth. Um, so, you know, it's, it was also Jesus' last instruction to us, something that obviously was a very important thing <laughs> to tell us before he left. Um, so for me, we are all Jesus' disciples and we are all uh, Jesus' ambassadors mm. uh, for the gospel. Yeah, no, you're right. I think the Great Commission for me uh, reminds me that God is ascending God. You know, he mm. sends us out, but he sent Jesus to us first. And, you know, in the last church that we were at before we came to Restore, um, that church had a real vision around church planting. You know, church planting was such a core part of who that church was. And uh, mm. in that church, it was where I really first began to understand um, the saying that um, you know, the local church is the hope for the world. Um, because when a local church comes and plants, itself in a community that's when things start to change um, and something that I've preached before is that I really love the message version of John chapter 1 verse 14 which mm. says that the, the word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood because mm. I have yeah, this that, that, I love yeah. this picture yeah. of um, I have this picture of Jesus becoming my next door neighbor and if Jesus was my next door neighbor me and him would hang out and we'd do really cool stuff together um, but actually Jesus has done more than move in next door to me actually Jesus has moved into my life um, and so that means that Jesus um, has moved not just into the neighborhood, he's actually moved into the local sports club, he's moved into my workplace, he's moved into our streets, he's moved into our into our local parks, um, because wherever we are, we carry Jesus with us into whatever space that we go into. Um, and so we should be expecting cool things to happen, mm, yeah. you know, in all these different places. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so I feel like each of us, therefore, have a mission, and mm -hmm. each of us, yeah. therefore, is a missionary. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 
So, so, um, so yeah, so we've covered a bit about the why. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's move on to the how now. Um, and I, I thought we could just maybe explore some of the practical things um, that you've done um, to connect with community. Yeah, OK. Uh, so I think the best place to build friendships with the people in, in our community is to start off with where you're at. Um, so um, the people closest to us geographically is our neighbours. Um, so uh, just a couple of uh, things that I do that I hope is helpful to all of us um, is uh, I would begin with starting with prayer uh, and then I would uh, begin with start, uh, looking at your interests and your passions. So uh, with prayer, what I do is that I use, uh, I actually have a mind map. Um, so on a blank piece of paper, I would draw out a circle and it, on, on this paper would be con all the connections I have with the people in my community. So centre and then to maybe one of them would be my neighbours. Mm. Uh, and then another one could be uh, my, uh, the school, uh, the school playground. Um, and another one could be at work. Um, so, um, so just as an example, with my neighbours, I would draw out from there. Uh, on my left, I know is uh, Carol, and she has a boyfriend called John. And to my right is Jeanette, who has two children. I'll write down their names. Uh, and then as you draw the, out that picture, you will see how much connection you have like with the people in your community. And so what I do with it every day is I just look at it. I don't have to pray for every one of them, uh, but what I do is I look at it and I ask, I let God lead me into who to pray for specifically. Um, and then the second thing that I do with uh, pr praying is uh, just praying in tongues and um, listening to the Holy Spirit. So, um, so uh, when I pray in tongues, uh, I gain like discernment um, and um, so, yeah, praying in tongues, you also, uh, you know, what we do in the physical, there's also the spiritual realm. Um, so praying in tongues would just heighten my sensitivity to the spiritual realm. Um, and also, you know, you can pray in tongues when you are working or you're just going for a walk. Um, so even if you think it's like an ordinary day, um, I, you know, uh, just as you pray, things happen. So just an example, uh, as I was walking down my neighborhood, my street and praying, um, uh, I passed uh, one of my neighbor's house called Pat uh, and uh, Pat wasn't there, but a lady came out of her side garden and uh, she, I asked her, I said, well, how's Pat, what's she doing? Um, and she told me that Pat went into a care home. Uh, so I, uh, however, from, from that connection with Pat, I made a new connection with this person who actually found out she just lives quite a few doors down to where I live, a new neighbour. Um, so um, that's, that's what I do with pr uh, praying. Mm. Um, the other thing that I do is, what, I'm, what I suggest is to uh, find out what your interests and your, what your passions are. Um, for me, you know, you've got to do something that you love, you love doing, because at the end of the day, it's about community, it's about uh, genuine connections with people. And I think having that interest with something just connects us together. Um, so I would look at, um, you know, maybe perhaps joining a, uh, an interest group, um, whether it's a church or uh, that's run by the, our church or uh, whether it's a community-based group. Um, so uh, one of the things that I have a passion for is connecting with uh, families uh, in our community. Uh, reason being because, uh, you know, we have our own family and we know sometimes how hard that can be. Um, and we have something in common. Um, so, uh, so I knew that our church, before COVID, before the lockdown, we ran a, a parent-toddler group called Noah's Ark. So I would volunteer myself, uh, you know, one, one, once a week, uh, one hour uh, for that time. And uh, all I do is just go in there, uh, have tea or coffee, and talk to the parents there, the carers, the grandparents, um, and, um, you know, connections build. And so um, I, one day, just a, a great story here, one day um, a, a lady called, uh, one of the mums called Charlene, and I got permission uh, from Charlene to share her story. And I just want to say hi to Charlene if you're watching. Um, so uh, yeah, so one day this, uh, this mum um, called Charlene came over and, and, asked, and said to me, Matt, um, I want to get baptised. How, how do I get baptised? Um, and, and I was taken aback, you know, a, a bit aback by it because um, yeah, basically, I asked her, like, uh, so why do you want to get baptised? Do you know who this Jesus is? 
And she said, no. Um, so um, then I kind of said, uh, then she explained that uh, when she was a child, her grandfather would take her to church, and she remembers that, uh, but she doesn't clearly understand the gospel. And so I said to her, look, Charlene, I think someone, you know, someone needs to explain to you the gospel, uh, and um, I'll share it to you about who Jesus is, uh, why you want to get baptised. Uh, so, you know, we need to make some time to do that, I think. Um, but that conversation ended, and, and it never, we never actually met up. For, actually, it took a year later, uh, partly because I think, uh, well, Charlene uh, wasn't regular. Uh, he came to Noah's Ark, but uh, also uh, we might have missed each other uh, when sometimes I wasn't there. Um, so uh, anyway, a year later uh, at Trinity Church, we, we were having a harvest festival, and Charlene came with her whole family, and she... Um, came up to me and says, Matt, I want to get baptised. How do I get baptised? And um, I was just like, it felt like deja vu or Groundhog Day. Um, but uh, I, I ended up saying the same thing to her, that you need someone to tell you about Jesus. And the conversation ended again. However, the next day, God prompted me and said, Matt, you need to tell Charlene about who I am and lead her to me. Um, I knew that was like a heavy prompting from God. So I immediately called Charlene, made the appointment within two days to see her at Trinity Church again. Uh, on that day, uh, I went and grabbed a female member of staff um, and I said to her, um, you know, uh, I'm going to share a gospel with someone. I'm going to uh, lead this person to Christ. Will you come with me? And that person was a bit taken aback by it. Uh, but... Um, you know, thinking, I think in her mind, she's thinking, how, how are you so sure that she's going to come to know Jesus, accept Jesus into her life? Well, I, I don't know, I just did, I just, just kind of uh, felt it and, and uh, heard it. And so uh, with that in mind, I just went in there, shared the gospel with Charlene, uh, and then she received Jesus. Um, so, uh, and it's just, it's, just, it's just amazing that, you know, when, when you look at it, uh, I just from a passion about wanting to know families mm -hmm. and spending one hour a week and connecting with people in my community, uh, that's what came out of it. Um, so uh, the other things that I could recommend about joining a group is if you can't find one, then perhaps uh, look for, uh, create your own group. So uh, for me, I love uh, badminton. And um, I, what I did was I tried to gauge with, I tried to ask people uh, with my community connections to say, would you want to play badminton? Would you be interested? And I need to get roughly about four, a minimum of four. And we found the four, you know, of, up to four of us. And I uh, started a group. And later on, as it grew, I, I then asked people in uh, our church uh, whether they would be interested so that it gives opportunity for people in our church to connect with people in our community. Uh, so then we grew to 10 people in our badminton group. Um, and uh, so that was just before lockdown. Um, and uh, we also would have lunch together too. Um, but during lockdown, we kept in touch through Zoom and then we met uh, uh, like in the park uh, for lunch, uh, up to six of us. Uh, and then we, uh, yeah, now we're playing badminton. We just started playing badminton uh, last week. That's great. Now. Yeah, yeah, so. No, I really love your um, examples there, and I really love the way that you've used your interests and your passions to create community uh, between people and, you know, and with yourself. And, and I think it really shows what happens when you take what's already in your hands and you offer it mm. to God. And for you, it was badminton and for fam families, um, but for other people, they might have other passions and interests. And, it, you know, it doesn't matter what it is in a sense. It's the, it, the thing is just the, the hook or the gel that kind of brings people together. And through that, you can um, create uh, friendships and, and relationships and mm, yeah. um, you know for me um, that's what we do at Grow Community Garden I know the vid my video is out this morning um, and um, you know we bring people with a passion for growing vegetables together um, and through doing that we've kind of created some really great friendships out of that and, and, and you know and connections with people in the community um, but I also get that, you know, not everyone can, you know, join a group right now and maybe you know, right, yeah. because of, you know, because of where they are in the yeah. life stage, because of, um, 
uh, demands on their time and, and even, you know, we're anticipating potentially more COVID restrictions. Yeah. Um, but I think what I kind of take from your stories um, and what you said is, is, is the importance of having that kind of mission mindset um, and, you know, the importance of being, you know, praying, praying into these, praying into, praying over these things um, and being led by the Holy Spirit um, to, to do whatever the Holy Spirit's calling to do wherever you're already at. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to kind of maybe just finish off by circling back to Isaiah 61, mm -hmm. because I want to yeah. suggest that sometimes we do have to go beyond our immediate circles and maybe go beyond even our own comfort zone um, in order to reach out to people who are um, brokenhearted, to reach out to people who are struggling with finances or struggling with mental health issues um, or struggling with addictions, people who are vulnerable, people who are sorry, isolated or lonely um, or, you know, and, and people who are, um, you know, in, in, in some kind of need. And, you know, I want to be really honest and say, yeah. you know, we've both had um, good experiences and bad experiences. Um, and, um, you know, and it does cost, you know, for us, it's cost us time, um, energy, um, emotion. Um, and sometimes it's cost us, you know, our resources as well. Um, yeah. But there's a, there's a verse in um, Isaiah 58, 10, which I think really speaks into this for me, because I feel like even though it can be hard sometimes connecting with community, um, I feel like it's something we shouldn't shy away from. And chapter, uh, Isaiah chapter 58 for me is a, one of my, another one of my favorite uh, passages in the, in the Bible. And in particular, verse 10 um, mm -hmm. says that um, um, for those who, uh, if you spend yourself um, on behalf of the hungry, um, and um, uh, if you spend yourself on behalf of the hungry, um, and if you satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness, and your night will become like the noonday. And for me, this says to me that if we spend ourselves, um, and spending will cost, you know, that if we spend ourselves on behalf of those who are in need, then actually this, um, we are able to bring God's light into situations of darkness. We are able to bring about the justice that God longs to see um, and that we capture yeah. some of the heart and compassion that God has for people um, who are brokenhearted, who are lost and who are marginalized and oppressed. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think we want to, you know, we want to be a Holy Spirit people, don't we, as a yes, church? Yeah. And we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We want to be led by the Holy Spirit. We want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit so that we can Amen. carry Jesus into all these um, different spaces that he's calling us to go to um, and, to, and to bring good news to, to, you know, to, to everyone around us. So I think I speak on behalf of both of us when I say I think that's a really exciting mission that we um, really love being on. Amen. Okay, so I think, um, yeah, have we run out of time for questions, uh, Ian? Oh, we haven't run out of time. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so how, many, how much time have we got? Sorry, Whoa. questions. Just know. one? Just one or two. Okay. <laughs> See how it goes. Great question. Okay. What? Uh, oh, my goodness. This is a really great question. All right, I'm going to ask the good oh, one wow. first. All right, okay, do you want to go first nice. or do you want me to go first? Uh, I could go first if you want. Uh, you, you can go. Okay, way, Matt, you're going to okay. love this one. Can you demonstrate some dance moves, Matt? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Uh, I could do one, uh, maybe a pirouette. I don't know. Uh, you wanna... I, I can't remember. No, I haven't done this for ages. I can't. I haven't done this for ages. So it's like oh, I don't know. Uh, another one would be I don't know. Uh, how about this one? How about this? Is that all right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's done. <better>. Okay. <laughs> Matt, that's amazing. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for wrote that, but yeah. Um, <laughs> we know you wrote that one, don't we, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so here's a good one. Uh, how do you manage to do all that you do and care for your family and meet the demands of having an autistic child? Wow. wow. Yeah, that's a really so. good question. Um, <laughs> you know what? The lockdown has actually really helped me um, uh, because I'm actually not commuting anymore and I'm also not travelling for work. Um, but I do feel like a big factor in being able to do all the things that I can do is actually you, Matt. Um, I feel like you're mm. my enabler. 
Um, they say that, you know, behind every successful woman is a, is a good man. I don't know whether they say that. I was the opposite. Actually. I know, I know, yeah, but yeah. But I feel like you're my enabler. You yeah. enable me to do the things that I, can, that I need to do. Mm, um, mm. And I'm so grateful for that. And I often, mm. you know, you say to me, I can't believe that you're talking to politicians or whatever. And I feel like, but I'm only able to do that because you, 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 you set me, you, know, you give me that time um, and you, you help look after kids when I need to travel and, and, and so on. Um, and you always support me. You know, I'm, I, I suffer from big time imposter syndrome you know I always think I'm you know I always think that I someone's gonna find me out any minute but you're you always um, encourage me and you always cheer me on and then the other thing that I always try to do is um, also try to create margin in my life as well that I try not to max out my diary um, so that there's always a bit of breathing space mm -hmm. um, and and certainly during the lockdown what I found really helpful is um, I've been um, uh, because I haven't been commuting in the morning, I've been using that time that I've kind of been set that that's been released to actually spend time in silence and stillness before God, and that really helps me in terms of getting my priorities right, in terms of um, um, reminding myself who I am in God, and that's so important for me. Um, uh, yeah, to help me cope with all that uh, mm, I have to contend mm, with. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, um, Matt, this is a really good question. Um, how does being of Chinese origin been a positive or a negative thing for reaching out to the local community in Loughton? Uh, well, for, I think for a start that I, I was, well, for me, I think sometimes uh, I forget that I'm Chinese, uh, just living here for, the, you know, for 40, 40 odd years. Um, I sometimes forget that, uh, so I just go all out. Uh, but on another hand, uh, when you approach someone, I think it also could be an advantage because, uh, you know, we, we, we look different um, as being Chinese, but we can have interesting conversations about just uh, sharing, um, you know, about our backgrounds and upbringings and uh, things that we struggle with. But, yeah, in, ge in general, I, I find it pretty much okay. I, I, yeah, I'm okay with uh, just talking. I love talking to people, uh, so it really doesn't hinder me that much. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, last question. Last question. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Uh, how do you deal with uh, feelings and frustrations and anger on the days when um, what's that? When apathy or greed see, seems to be the winner. When apathy or greed seems to be the winner. Mm. Yeah. Actually, for me, you know, because I work quite closely to. Um, to kind of political processes. Um, I work, you know, we do a lot of advocacy work, um, mm. lobbying of politicians and so on. And mm -hmm. actually the closer I get to an issue, the more easy it is to feel like the world is stitched up, like the, that, that all the, the power dynamics are stitched up behind the scenes between, yeah. you know, people who hold power. And that often the people who lose out are those who are the most on, you know, who are the, on the margins of society, those who have the least economic um, resources, you know, the poorest people in the world, um, the poorest communities in the world. So, um, and, and sometimes I can, it can feel really demoralizing and feel like you can't change anything. Um, and, uh, and so actually in those times, what I, I often have to do is I have to just go back to God again and remind myself that actually my hope actually isn't in politics. Actually, my hope isn't in politicians, but that my mm. hope is in God um, mm -hmm. and trusting yeah. that God um, is sovereign and that God, um, you know, God, is, God, God, is, God is there and that my hope is ultimately in him. Mm. I always pray for you, actually, as well. That when you, I know, when you, when I know you have big meetings, I know that it's like David and Goliath. Uh, but I do pray for you when you have those meetings.